Okay, so this uh, lecture of Remy now will be effectively the final, well, it's not the final session, but it's the final lecture of the school component of uh, our program. Uh, of course, there will be a tutorial after the lecture, and it will be only as long as you want to make it. Because, uh, and, and, uh, because it's quite, uh, Remy is giving two lectures and, and there's many people waiting to talk to him. So if you have questions, ask. If not, uh, uh, the tutorial will be a short session. But uh, so starting tomorrow, uh, we will have the sort of the regular program schedule. So we'll have a lecture at 11, uh, usually every day. Okay. okay. Um, so, I so I will go on after what uh, we talk about this morning, and um, so I, I hope you remember where we stopped. We stopped basically. Um, uh, so we look at auto encoders, and um, we talk about sparse dictionary learning, and um, we had this architecture with two layers. We had one layer which were, where the, the data were presented, and another layer which was the representation layer. And the question was, how can we represent the data with some kind of sparse representation, uh, which is still faithful? Okay, so you want to be sparse and accurate. So I'm going to present um, the second part of this morning lecture. So this is lecture 2.5, um, where I'm 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 going to to talk about resistible smart machines. Uh, so resistible smart machines are machines which were invented about 30 years ago in. Um, in computer science, but for a long time, so I will come back to that, but for a long time, they have been not very much used simply because there was no good training algorithm. And the situation has partly changed over the last 10 years. So they are not mainstream machine learning in a sense, they are not doing, they are not deep networks or these kind of things which are very popular right now. But I think they are very interesting from a statistical physics point of view. And still, they, they, they can be also interesting for applications, so that's what I would like to talk about. Okay, so here's the machine. So again, this is exactly the same architecture as the one we end uh, up with uh, this morning. So you have two layers. One layer is called the visible layer, where you have your inputs. And another layer is called the hidden layer, when you have your representations. So exactly the, the last architecture we saw this morning. And in between, you will have connections. So this is a particular kind of machine on a bipartite graph. You have connection only in between the layers and nothing inside the layers. So, um, so the machine itself corresponds to the definition of a joint distribution for the input configuration, the visible configuration, and the hidden configurations. So I will call V. So V will be a set of uh, will be a set of in, of input uh, units here, and H will be a set of hidden units. Okay. So they are both vectors. So the idea is to define a Boltzmann distribution for both V and H at the same time. Uh, which is written this way, where Z is the uh, partition function, the normalization, and the energy E is, uh, is given in this way. So we have three different terms in the energy, one, local terms, one set of local terms on the visible units, we have local terms on the hidden units, and we have couplings in between. So for simplicity in this presentation, I will assume that the visible units are 0, 1. It doesn't have to be this case. Actually, in application, if you have a little bit of time during the tutorial, I will show you applications where the, the visible unit takes 20 values because they are amino acids. But I mean, let's, let's assume they are zero one. They could be also real numbers. So if you have a potential acting on a variable d i, which is zero one, then of course this can always be uh, linearized. So I can always write this as u zero uh, plus uh, G i d i, it's a potential, it depends on the index of the hidden, and u0 does not matter, it's just a shift. So forget about that. So the local potential is the G i d i, where G i is the local field. It's a local magnetic field. That you see here. <coughs> no, no. Okay. And then we have exactly the same thing now on the H's, except that the H's now, I'm not restricting the H's to be 0, 1. In some architectures, what people call Bernoulli um, run uh, recipe Boltzmann machines, they are 0, 1, but here I will take them as 
uh, real valued. So there is a potential U of H acting on the um, unit H mu. So I will be the index of the visible units and mu the index of the hidden units. Um, okay, so U of H is a very important thing. U mu of H mu. And this plays the role of this pacifying condition we had, remember, this morning. So think of it as something which is basically confining the value of H so that H doesn't go to infinity and will favor small values. So to start with, you can think of U of H as maybe H mu squared over 2, you know, with some coefficient. But you will see that actually is a natural form which is something we like in statistical mechanics, but it's far from being the best one. I'll come back to that because it's an important point. But let's say it's a potential, right? And then you have couplings in between the VI and the H mu, and this is the usual couplings you can think of. WI mu will, will be this connection between hidden unit uh, mu and visible unit I. Okay? So that's a machine. So the machine is this one. So this distribution defines completely the um, joint distribution, this thing. Now, of course, we don't know what the representation should be. Actually, the whole thing is to learn interesting representation. What we know are only visible configuration in our database. So we have to define the marginal distribution over the visible units, which formally can be written as the integral over all possible representation of this joint distribution. Okay? Formally, I can write this. And the log of this is some ex effective energy on the visible layer. And what we will do in the training is actually we will maximize the marginal probabilities of the configurations we have in the data set, which are sets of these, okay? And this will be done by optimizing all the parameters which come in here into this um, effective energy, which are all these um, uh, all these weights here, which are these local fields, and which are some parameters uh, which are important for potential. So, for instance, if we restrict to quadratic potential, then you would have to optimize over the curvature of the potential and maybe some offset. You would optimize over this, right? If you have more complicated things, then they would parameterize by more parameters. Oh, no, no, the, the W, that's a crucial thing. Everything interesting is in the W. So, you, have to, you want to optimize over the W. No. Why should there be? You can have negative couplings. You will see. Me yes, you will see examples which are very close to. I mean, it's a it's an extension of a Hopi model. You would see it's a generalization of a Hopi model, which have been totally. Uh, I think it's. Mo I think it's more interesting than the Hopi model. It's a. It's a. You will see the Hopi model, Hopi model is a special case, but I'll come to that later. Okay, so. That's a machine. Is it clear for the definition? And now, the hope is that if you do that, then you will extract parameters here, which will actually build representation which are interesting. That means each time you present some visible configuration here, it will compute some hidden configuration which is interesting. So let's see what that means. Okay, okay so there are two things to be said here. First of all, when you have a machine like that, first of all, you should be able to learn the parameters to train it. So I, I, want, I don't want to get into the details of the learning algorithm, but just to say a few things. Um, so usually you are given a data set, which is a set of uh, visible configurations. You have, for instance, B configuration. Each one is a vector of length n. And you want to maximize the log likelihood. So you want to maximize the sum of the old configuration in your database of log of B. This B is the marginal one. Okay? But you see, it's quite involved because you have to integrate over the HEs. So all the interactions, effective interaction in between the visible units, they come through this, this integration here. Otherwise, there would be no interaction at all. So I, the idea is that any interaction is actually driven by some common input, uh, which is an interesting idea. Okay. So, and if I want to, to be very schematical, you can imagine that this is your space of visible configuration here, and this is the marginal distribution, and at the end of the learning, what you would like is to define some curve here, where your data items, so for instance, remember the digits in the dataset, they will have high probability 
and any kind of random configuration which is meaningless will have low probability. This is what you would like to achieve, right? But of course, the smoothness of this curve is defined by this particular uh, function. OK. So until 2000 something, uh, it was actually quite hard to run this kind of machine. It's still not easy. Uh, but there was some, a lot of progress made by, the, uh, by Hinton and collaborators in 2002 and uh, even later uh, with an algorithm which is called contrasted divergence, which is an extension of Boltzmann machine running. Maybe I'll, in the tutorial I can tell you a little bit about that later on. But, so but let's say the algorithm is the following. You want to maximize this, you write down the gradient. So there are many parameters, but let me draw the write down the equation for the gradient over the weights. If you differentiate this, you see there are two parts here in P. One part is the effective energy, one part is the partition function. You take the log, there are two terms, and each term will contribute to the gradient. So I don't want to do the calculation in details, but the only thing I want to say is that if you do the calculation precisely, you see that the gradient is proportional to the difference between the correlation function between h mu and vj, sorry, it's vi, it's a i, it's not a j, h mu and vi, which is the correlation fun function between hidden, hidden unit mu and visible unit i, correlation function over the joint distribution p of vh, over the model, the machine, minus what you would find for this correlation function in the data. So, of course, in the data, you don't know the h's, but given the the V, so take for instance one configuration in your, in your data and put it here on the visible layer. Once you have done that for each configuration of your data, so you take one, you put it on the visible layer, the H's are random variables which are all independent because they're not coupled in between. So you can define the average value of H mu, which depends on the particular configuration here, and then you can average over all conf visible configuration. So this is what I call this term here, average value over the model for a given data configuration on the visible layer times VI, uh, sorry again, it's a VI, and you average over the data. So you see that the gradient is actually realizing here what I call also in the previous lecture on Monday, moment matching conditions. So you want a correlation function between visible and hidden units in the model to match the values in the data. And actually, the learning algorithm is doing that, and it's changing the weights until these conditions are satisfied, uh, to some accuracy, yes. OK? This is similar to Boltzmann machine learning. I will come back to that uh, later. Is it more or less clear? OK. So the implementation of that is actually uh, quite tricky, because this is easy to compute. There is not a lot to be done, but this is very hard. Because that means that you have to sample from the model, so you have to do extensive Monte Carlo, and so on. So it's not something, and you have to be sure it's thermalized and so on. Uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain, Monte Carlo. That's people in uh, computer science, they, don't, they, they write MCMC. That looks more serious, I think. But that's Monte Carlo. They claim they had invented Monte Carlo, yeah. uh, probably because uh, MC, MC squared, I don't know. But who, who knows? Anyway. Um, OK, so that's the learning part, very briefly. So now, suppose you have done that, then you end up with a machine. So all the parameters are known, they are in your computer. Now you want to use the machine. So how do you do that? You need to do something. Actually, something is also a part of this in doing the learning. But suppose it's, you have finished the learning, now you want to use it. So sampling is actually quite nice with RBM uh, due to the bi bipartite nature of a graph. So now uh, this um, kind of ellipse represents one particular visible configuration, so the set of n values at time zero. So you start with something, maybe one in your data set or anything you want. You put it on your machine. And once it is uh, fixed here, actually, you can sample the hidden unit configurations because they are, they are, it's very easy to do. You sample one by one because they are all independent, conditioned to the visible layer. Do you agree? And because they all they see the visible units, but they don't see the other hidden units. So they are independent. So the distribution of conditional distribution of the H mu 
is factorized over the uh, over the mu. So, for instance, each hidden each hidden unit mu is receiving some input, which is sum over i w i mu v i, and then its distribution is given by exponential minus the potential here, plus times some local field. So the input is acting as a local field on the variable h mu. A new sample from that, which is easy. You do that for all the mu's, and you get a new configuration h. Once you have it, you just do it backward. Given the representation configuration, all the visible units are independent. So now you compute the input on, in, on visible unit i, which is sum of the mu w i mu h mu, and you sample from this thing where the i is 0, 1. So it's exactly like if I had a pipeline that Yes, exactly. And then we do that. You, you just go forward and backward thing. You know, so it's very easy to do. That doesn't mean it mixes very quickly, but it, it's very easy to do. Okay? And so the underlying assumption is that actually this sampling procedure has some meaning. The meaning is that given a data configuration, you are extracting some features from the data, you are extracting what is meaningful from the data, and the H mu will tell you how much the feature associated to mu is present. And once you have your representation, then you can generate new data, you can reconstruct new data from the knowledge of a representation. This is the underlying idea. Now, whether it works or not depends on whether you were successful in the training and so on, but the, the, the idea... Yes. Exactly. Okay, so it's a, it's a specific case of Monte Carlo. Is it clear? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, so again, this is a NIST that you have seen uh, many times, at least uh, one time, uh, on Monday. And um, so you can take all this database, you have 60,000 digits, and so this is 60,000 configuration Vs, and you learn the machine. So again, these are 28 by 28 uh, images, so it means that the dimension of the visible layer is 784. And I will show you now what happens if you learn these things with the RBM whose uh, hidden layer has dimension 400. And I talk again about how you choose the dimension here of the hidden layer, which is a parameter which is very crucial. But so far, let me just give you an example. So what you will see on the next slide here uh, is the outcome after the learning is done. Um, I will come back also what that means, uh, rectify linear units. I already talked a little bit this morning about it. So 400 linear units, after the learning is done, you, can, you will see 10 independent Monte Carlo simulations. So there will be 10 pictures. And these are just snapshots of the configuration on the visible layer during this Monte Carlo simulation. They are all independent. But they, so they are all obtained with the same machine from initial conditions which are different. Okay, so this is it. So you can look at any of them. They are all identical in the sense that they are, but they are just the initial condition is different. So if you wait very, very long, then in principle that should be acodic and then, then they, they would be identical statistically. Okay, so what you see is that actually, I, I find it nice in the sense that, you see, uh, the machine is actually generating digits. And these digits, uh, they are not always perfect, but they don't look crazy. It's not bad. You see, there is no deep architecture here. It's just one layer. One layer. And uh, what is interesting also is that, the, depending on the initial condition, sometimes you see many variants of the same digits for two. But sometimes it just jumps to another digit, so I don't know which one you should look at in order to see that very... It's, it's just uh, looping, so I don't know which one is interesting. You can see that, maybe, maybe this one, you see it, it goes very fast. So you see a three, a two, an eight, seven, a nine, and what, it goes very fast. So something seems to be fast um, for some initial condition. Okay, so this is, so here is just the machine. So here I, I wanted to show that, just to sh show the generative power of a machine. It just generates new configuration. It, it doesn't only generate representation as a, a sparse dictionary learning techniques would do. It uses also the representation to generate new data. So just to be, to be clear, um, 
most of the configuration you are seeing here are not in the database. They are not very far away from the database. We have computed, for instance, the average distance, about maybe it depends very much, varies between a few pixels to maybe 20 pixels, you know, or maybe more than that, it depends. But clearly, they are not in the database, but they look uh, more or less nice. Okay, so now a crucial aspect of that is uh, what kind of potential U of H you use. Okay, as I said, the natural choice would be something like that. Okay, so um, U of H, uh, here, you can see what U of H is going to do, and this is related to the activation function I was talking about this morning. So for instance, suppose I am, I am freezing the uh, visible unit configuration and I'm looking at the uh, hidden units. So I want to sample H mu from this distribution, right? This is what I explained before. So this distribution will have some top value, so it will be maximal for some h mu, which maximizes the, the exponent here. So let me see where the maximum is. It's when the derivative of u with respect to h is equal to i, the input, which corresponds to this thing here. Or you can inverse this relation, and that gives h as a function of the input. right? And this is exactly the, what I, I was explaining this morning. As a function of the input here, you would expect that a good h should be large when the input is large, and maybe it should be small when the input is not too large, okay? That was, you remember what we discussed this morning? Right? Yeah, so the, the idea is that large inputs correspond to signal and small inputs correspond to noise, and maybe it should just be cancelled. Okay, so if you look at this thing here, then that tells you uh, uh, what this transfer function phi should be, so by inverting this and taking the integral, you, you find the u of h, which is nice. OK, so if you do that, you find that the u of h is going to be something like that. So this is a theta here, threshold. So it's a potential which will have a very a hard wall in negative h, because h cannot be negative. So it goes to infinity for negative h, and then it will start in h equal to 0 with a finite slope, which is equal to theta, and then it will grow like h squared over 2. So that's theta h here, if you want. That's the slope, right? So this is the potential that we, that we use in the simulation that you have seen. Well, if I use the natural potential, which would be u of h equal to h squared over 2, for instance, up to some offset, which doesn't matter, then what you would get for the transfer function, so this is the most likely h as a function of the input, you would get simply a linear curve, which has absolutely no, nothing about noise reduction here close to the origin. OK, I'll come back to that later because this is important. So now. If we do a simulate uh, learning not with this potential here, which seems to be, I mean, nice because it has this nice property, but we do it with this one, which is more natural, let's say, then you will see what it gives. So look at this. I'm just uh, pressing the button. Yeah, so this is what you get. So they're exactly the same conditions, same number of hidden units, same learning time, everything is just learning with the same algorithm, except that we have changed the potential. So you see that the digits are not so nice. <coughs> um, the system gets stuck somewhere in things which are close to digits, but uh, not very nice, and this is what you get. It's much worse than this one. Yeah, so the gamma mu, sorry, the gamma mu were tuned also here. So here there is a gamma, and here there is also a gamma. It was tuned on the offset also. So the big difference is really the idea that you have this hard wall on the, on the slope. So that, that really reduces uh, the noise. So I'll come back to that later, because this is deeply re related to the Hoffman model. OK? So you see that the choice of a potential on the, on the hidden units is crucial for performances. OK. 
So, so what happens actually if we choose that? So let's make uh, let's do a little bit uh, a very uh, short calculation on this black ball. So let me consider this poten sorry let me consider this potential here and see what it gives for the uh, Rusty Boltzmann machine. So if I use this potential, you see the joint energy is this one. So you have a local fields on the visible units. You have the couplings. And you have the local potential, which are just h mu squared over 2. So if I look at the joint distribution, the Boltzmann distribution, I have exponential minus some of the mu h mu squared over 2. So if I want to compute the marginal, I have to integrate over the h mu's. And this is just a Gaussian integral over the h mu's. Is it clear for everybody? So this can be done exactly. Okay, you see, I have exactly this thing here. I have integral will be a product of a mu. So when I integrate over all possible representation, I have something like that. Minus sum of a mu, wi mu, sorry, uh, vi h mu. And obviously, the integral can be done exactly up to square root of 2 pi. We don't care. It's going to be exponential, one half, sum of a mu, because they are all independent. There was a sum of i here. And then I get sum of i, value i mu, the i squared. Right? So let me expand this sum here. And you see that this thing here is equal to sum of i and j, the i, sum of a mu, the value i mu, wj mu, vj. So what do we recognize here? We recognize a model with pairwise interaction between the visible units with effective couplings, jij, which are given by this expression. That means that when you take u of h equal to h squared over 2, the model you have is effectively an Ising model okay, on the visible layer, if you forget about the... Uh, the um, hidden layer. So, and this is what I wrote here. So essentially, your machine is just behaving as a model for over the input layer with some effective connections between the visible units, gij, which are given by this expression. So now, the opposite is true. That means if I don't have u of h equal to h squared over 2, but I have something which is uh, more complicated, the effective energy for the visible units will be will have interaction to higher orders. So it's a much more interesting, maybe complex landscape which is generated. But contrary to spin glasses, the um, couplings are not independent from each other. They are all generated from the set of WI mu, so they are all correlated. So it's a it's a high high order potential landscape, but with a lot of correlation between the different orders. So it's a, it's a complex thing. Is it uh, is it clear? More or less? You agree on the fact that do you agree on this formula? Calculation was not clear. Shall we go back to that? Just let me know. I mean, I cannot guess. How many of you want? Do you understand what I'm? Three or four of you, five. Do you understand what I'm, I'm trying to do? You understand that you have two layers, right? You have the visible layers, you have the uh, representation layer, and they talk to each other, right? And now what I'm saying is that if I integrate over all the possible representation, what is the effective model for my data? And what I'm saying is that when u of h is h squared, then the effective model is an Ising model. Of course, this is a complicated Ising model because the gij depends on i and j. This is not uniform in 2D uh, translation variant. That's something complex. But it's an Ising model. Otherwise, if u of h is not h squared over 2, it's much more complicated. And it seems to be much more powerful. You agree on the message? Yeah. So actually, it's one particular case of the IZ model where if you look at this matrix here, you see. Um, the Sorry, yes. Oh, you get interaction to. You get interaction to all orders. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you expand, for instance, when you, you know, you, you get everything which is a polynomial. So suppose this is h cube, you get three body. So as soon as this is not a pure, 
a finite degree polynomial, you get everything. But, but, but the magnitude of a different depth. Yes, so that's totally controlled by the shape here. So one thing is that the GIJ matrix, when you write it this way, you see that there is a mu runs from one to the total number of hidden units, so that means it's a bound on the rank of the matrix. Actually, this model, this type of Ising model, where the GIJ are, are written like that, that's called the Hopfield model. So I, I, I'll explain a little bit about the Hopfield model is, because it's an important model in, in spin glasses, which came from, um, from neuroscience. But this is related to that. So maybe I, I should explain it that now. So the Hopfield model, so it's a, it's a crash course on the Hopfield model. So that comes from this paper, a 1982 paper, which is a famous paper by John Hopfield. And his motivation was uh, actually um, coming from neuroscience. Why here there is a, here it's some kind of artificial neuroscience, artificial neural nets, but this is clearly not a, a neuroscience. Um, and what John Hoffield wanted to do is have had a simple model, simple enough in terms of writing the model, which is able to encode some specific state of activities. He wanted to build some memories, auto-associative memories. So just to explain how that works, suppose you have a model and you have different um, formal neurons, the SI, which may be plus or minus one or zero one, and they are connected through some connection J I J. And um, these neurons are based on dynamical equations, on dynamical evolution equation, which is some kind of zero temperature dynamical equation. So at time t, all the neurons, so sorry, it's not SI, it's a VI. All the neurons will have some state of activity. And what you do is that you will compute the local field acting on neuron i at time t plus one, compare it to some threshold which play exactly the same role as a minus magnetic field, and then depending on the sign of this, you will align this spin to plus one or to minus one. So it's exactly zero temperature global dynamics. I hope I think you have heard about global dynamics or when you do yes. Okay. I have. Uh, the theta is a local field, but it's fixed. It's fixed. It's fixed. Yeah. Yes. Quenched. It's fixed. I just want to know whether you have heard, uh, you have already seen this kind of, uh, of dynamical equation. That's a zero temperature version of uh, of evolution equation, right? Is it okay? Okay. So now you ask what is going to be the long term uh, behavior of the system, then. Um, Maybe at some point, if you wait long enough, it will converge to a fixed point of the dynamics. In fact, it does because you can show, I won't do the calculation, but it's a very easy calculation. You can show, since it's exactly a zero temperature evolution equation for this particular energy here, you can show that this energy will always decrease. So this function is a Lyapunov function. It will always decrease in, during the dynamics. That is, if you start somewhere in the configuration space here, you do this dynamics here, then you are sure that this function will decrease, so you will end up in a local minimum of this function. So Hoffield's uh, idea was the following. Suppose I want to build a memory. That means I want to be sure that the fixed point of a long time states of my, my network correspond to some specific configuration of activity I would like to memorize. Okay, so you want to fix the values of the minima, minima here. You want this minimum to be one specific state of activity, this one, another one. How should you engineer the connection in between the neurons in order to realize exactly this minima? Okay, that's one way to think about it. So it's, it's a problem where you want to find connections in between the neurons in order to be sure that the fixed point of this dynamic corresponds to a specified set of, of uh, patterns of activity, of configurations of activity. And what was shown a few years after using spin glass techniques is that that you can do um, with this particular construction here. So suppose your set of, of configuration activities are the wi mu. So you have wi mu will be the, the value of neuron i in configuration mu. If the number of configuration you want to memorize p is smaller than 
than 0.14 times the number of neurons, then you can do it. That will work. That means the local minima of this energy will be close to the state, W mu. If you are above this critical value, 0.14, it's a disaster, and the local minima will be completely different, uncorrelated, essentially. So this 0.40 is called the maximal capacity of this network. So I, this is complicated results, but I mean, the idea is the following. You have, you want, you have in your configuration space, you have a few points that you are considered as interesting, and you want a network which is able to have these points as fixed points of the dynamics. What kind of connection should you built in the network in order to realize this fixed point. And how many of them can you do? And the number, of course, the larger the network, the more fixed point you can have, and there is a critical ratio which is 0.14. If you are above, you cannot do that with this specific rule. Uh, for a given set of JJs, uh, this is a fully connected model. Yes. Right? So I expect some kind of a, a mean field uh, landscape where I have exponential numbers of minima. Yes, that is true. Right. So, but, but the so one might imagine that if I'm sitting in the basin of any one of these uh, minima, I, I should then. Yes, exactly. The you are right. So there is another value of this thing, which is around 0.6. I don't remember exactly where. Yeah. This, but this is linear in n. Right? This is linear in n. So essentially, uh, what frequency is saying is absolutely correct. So you have a t the number of states is 2 to the n here. So what I'm saying here is that among these 2 to the n states, which is an absolutely an enormous number, you can have a number of states which is scaling only linearly with n, 0.14 n, where if you start close enough, then the dynamics will converge to exactly to the state you are interested in, or very close to it. But if you start too far away, you are not in the basin of attraction, you will convert to something which has nothing to do. Okay? So that means that at least you have a finite basin of attraction around the states you are interested in. Then the size of the basin is something which is interesting that I don't want to talk about. But the point is that my restricted Boltzmann machine, you see, I mean, the whole thing is a little bit abstract, but this machine here, we are interested in here, is a Hoffield model when u of h is equal to h squared. OK? That, that was my point. When u of h is not h squared, it's something else. It's an, extended, an extension of the Hoffman model. So it, it, there is a very strong connection with statistical mechanics and spin glass theory. OK, so now let's go back to the, uh, we'll come back to that later. Let's come back to the uh, u of h equal to uh, this thing here. Or with Bernoulli, you need something which is actually different from h squared. That's the point. And see what happens when we change, you do the training always on MNIST, and that was from this paper here, but you change the value of the number of hidden units. So you can have a machine, you know, the dimension of a visible layer is fixed, it's 28 by 28 pixels, so it's 784. That's the dimension, you cannot change it. But of course, you can change the dimensions of your representations. So here is an example where there were 16 hidden units. And here's an example where there were, there were 100 of them. The simulation I've shown before was, was with 400. Same U of H. So you change only the number of hidden units. So what is going on is interesting. So each time, again, this is the same kind of representation as this morning. For one of these 16 hidden units, so this one, for instance, this hidden unit is seeing the 784 pixels with some ways, W, I mu, mu is fixed, but this is mu equal one here, and I runs from one to 784, and for each one, for each I, you show the, the, the corresponding coupling. Let's say gray is zero, uh, white is positive, and black is negative. So you see some kind of color code or gray level code telling you what the Ws are. So if you look at that, what is your impression compared to this one? So for instance, you look at this one, you see that this one, all the Ws uh, are essentially zero, except in a small patch here. And this is true, you know, so here, here you have a little bit of positive one, a little bit of negative one, and all the rest is zero. This is much more similar to what, this is very similar to what I, have, I was showing this morning, remember? When we do this fast dictionary learning. And this is true in, in most cases. 
Well, if you look here, you see you get, of course, a lot of zeros on, on the boundaries because actually in the database, there are never anything, there is never anything on the boundaries. So the digit is always in the center. But here, you see the positive waves are all over the place, and you see a, pa a patch of negative one on here and here. So there are more, it's, it's much larger. So it's much sparser on the right and much less sparse on the left. First observation. Then the other observation, maybe you need some distance to see it, maybe some lack of distance, I don't know. But look at that. So here you can recognize some f a five. You agree? You don't see any five here, right? Here I like to recognize a one. Here maybe some main branch of a seven. And you see uh, maybe some two is a little bit hidden here, some kind of zero. Obviously a six here, you know. So my impression when I see that it these are prototypes. Okay? In the sense that there are some kind of of pattern for the whole digit. Well, these things here are small patches, and of course I cannot recognize any digit on that. I need many of them to make a digit. So that's important because it, it, what I want to claim is that actually there is a phase transition between these two regimes. It's not only a qualitative change. I mean, it's not only a quantitative change, it's a real qualitative change. So since my lecture were about phase transition, I wanted to mention that because I think it's interesting. So this regime is very similar to the off-field model regimes where you have memorized items. This one is something which does not exist in the off-field model. Okay, so, uh, so I'd like to explain that. So the prototype regime, so this, this regime here, what does it mean? It means the following. It means that if I run a Monte Carlo with such a machine, what will happen is that one hidden unit will be very strongly activated, it will have very strong age, and the visible configuration will look like its weights. Okay? And so that's why these weights here are a prototype for the visible configuration. And all the other edges will be very small. So that means that, remember, that this thing here will be very similar to the weights, so the VI will be very similar to the w WI1, that will create a large edge, and all the other ones will be small. Okay? And this is very similar to the Hopfield model, because in the Hopfield model, when you are in a configuration here, what will happen is that you will be, in maybe the state of activity will be W mu equal one. Okay? And you will be, will be stuck there. Actually, the model was invented to do ex the model was invented to do exactly that. It could be in the state W1, in the state W2, and so on. Okay? So that means the weights are prototypes for a state of activity. They were invented exactly to do that. What I'm saying is that the RBM is behaving when you have a small number of hidden units exactly in the same regime. If you increase the dimension of the hidden layer, then you get into a regime which has nothing to do with that. It's a regime which looks as much more of a sparse dictionary. I was and the sparse and autoencoders I was mentioning this morning. So here the parameters are, are learned. No, no, they are learned. They also, you have also a gradient equation to maximize the likelihood. So they, they do depend on the, um, on the sparsity here, absolutely. They will scale with the sparsity. Okay, so the, the other regime is, is more interesting it's some kind of compositional regime, because now the question is, suppose this is the set of features of my machine, how do I compose a two, a five, a six, or eight from this? I have to glue together many small patches in order to find a two, right? I cannot just use one of them and say, oh, that's my two. Much bigger. But there is a trick to that, because the capacity depends on how you measure it. The capacity of this machine is virtually infinite, in the sense that you can store as many patterns as you want. Yes, exactly. And this exactly in the dictionary. You can have huge dictionaries. But it depends on how you measure it, because here, don't remember that the number of connections is growing with the number of, uh, of in an unit. So it's p times n. It's not n squared. You know, so it depends how you measure it. Well, it's, it's essentially close to one in a sense, yes, 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 but if, well, 
Okay, but anyway, but I mean, anyway, it's important because it, it tells you that you can have a very large, you don't have this problem of inter interference between the different patterns. I, I, I'll come back to it. Okay, so how do you make a number from all these small patches? So you see, the representation is telling you, so H1 is telling you whether you have a small positive patch here in the middle of the corner. This one is telling you whether in the, so in the south border you have a small patch, positive one, and so on. So you, and they will, be, they will have some values, and from that you want to reconstruct a, a digit. So just to give you an intuition about what is going on. So here are the simulations with 400 hidden units, and you see just a, a small number of, of their features, of their weights. <coughs> At any time, if you just take a random configuration on the visible layer, a sample from Monte Carlo, more than 250 hidden units are equal to zero. They are below threshold. That means a large fraction of the, of, the, of the representation is to zero. And then the other ones, most of the other ones are actually very close to the threshold. They are very small. So they don't contribute. They do nothing. But then we have some way of estimating the largely activated hidden units, and you have about 20 of them. That means by combining 20 patches, you get a digit. So, so it's not a prototype. It's a one twentieth of prototype regime. Right? And this number, of course, depends on on where on the size of the hidden layer compared to the visible layer. Um, yes, and they are sparser and sparser, and you need more and more. So one thing, uh, so you can see very clearly after learning that the weights are sparse if you have a large enough uh, hidden layer. And what is interesting is that the few weights which are non-zero, they are big. So here you can see the scale of the weight, they are big which means that given a representation, most of the value of hidden units are zero, but the one which remains non-zero, some of them are very big. The weights are big, so they give some, some fields on the visible units, which are large. That means that the spins on the visible layer, they are effectively, are effectively at very low temperature. So it's a very low temperature regime. The temperature here was inferred. There is no temperature put by hand, it's just the magnitude of the coupling. In fact, it has to be very low temperature because remember when we, I show you the simulation here, maybe I can show you again. So here you can see the simulation here. You see, there is no noise. We don't see, for instance, this pixel here from, it's always black, it never goes to, to, to white. So that, that is a proof that the model is effectively a very low temperature, otherwise it would be you know, very noisy and fuzzy. So this machine is actually learned automatically and set in a very low temperature regime. Okay, so maybe I should skip this uh, because it's more technical. So I just want to say that um, I, I just want to give an idea of why, I mean, what are the different regimes where this machine can work, okay? So there is a real phase transition which in, with a phase which does not exist in the whole field model. So let me try just to give you some intuition again about that because I want to insist on that. So what is the problem? So for instance, we have spaces so suppose you are looking at this space of digits. Remember, so it's a 28 by 28 pixel problem. And each one can be black or white. So the number of configuration is 2 to the 784. That's the total number of possible configuration. That's the space. And I represent this space by this square here. Now I give you 60,000 points. That's a good digit. 60,000 is nothing compared to that, right? So what you get is an extremely sparse sampling, and you know that all these points are good. Now you want to build a machine which is actually giving in the direction getting out of a blackboard, okay? It's giving you some number, which is some score, some probability of each point. It will give you a score for any point. Obviously, the 60,000 there, but all two to the 784 points it will have a number. And you would like this function here, which is defined by the machine, to have a high values for these 60,000. The question is, how do you do that? And the RBM is doing that. So what kind of function can do that? So I want just to, 
to say that there might be maybe three different kind of functions, maybe more if you have more ideas that you don't have, but just let me know if you have other ideas, that would be interesting, to do that. So one way to do that is to have something like that, is to have, for instance, each hidden unit, so hidden unit number one, for instance, and two and three, maybe some of them, they will be very good at detecting a very small subset of, this, of these points, of these 60,000 points. They will be very strongly activated, large H here, and if I choose another point on the visible layer, they will be silent. So a hidden unit will model very carefully one portion of, a sequence of, the, of the configuration space, another one, another portion, and so on. OK? So that's basically the prototype regime. It's a mixture model. It's a model which actually, you have the hidden units, they work only in a small part of the configuration space, and they do their job there. And if you are outside, then they, they are silent. You never use them. It's a prototype. And this is very similar to the Hoffi model. The Hoff, it's a way to interpret the Hoffi model. This is what it does. You are in a basin, and you look at this basin, and you don't care about what is going on elsewhere. That's a possibility. It's a mixture model. But you see, that's, that's a bad idea. Because if there are some invariant properties, some properties you know, that are similar in different points here, then you will not be able to exploit these invariances. Because what you have is a bunch of independent models. That's not a good way of representing the data. Now you could have some completely different way, which I could be an um, entangled model. I don't know how to call it, but anyway. That means all hidden units, they will be basically um, looking at a large part, maybe not everything as I plot it here, but at a large part of, a, of the configuration space. But, so they will be all activated. But if I move from one point to another one in my, all the levels, all the HMU will change a little bit. So I have a, you know, a 400 dimensional vectors of HMU. I move a little bit and they will all shift a little bit. That's a very non-sparse representation. It can be very accurate. But it's a nightmare in terms of understanding what is going on. Because if I go from one point here to another one here, I will have a four-dimensional vector full of components. Another one, they will have deferred a little bit. How do I interpret what these numbers mean? So maybe it's a good representation in terms of likelihood. And in fact, I would like to show you some, if I have time, some data showing you that. If you are not careful, this is exactly what is going on. But this is not inter interesting because it is not interpretable. So the regime we are interested in is some regime which is different, where, in fact, due to the sparsity of our representation, um, some here, for instance, if you are here in this point, you will have some uh, features which are activated here. Each color corresponds to one hidden unit which has a strong H. Okay? And you need, so you see small, a small patch of a digit, and you need four of them to make a digit. In what I've shown before, it was 20 but I was too lazy to make 20 bars, so I, I, I drew only four. And if you go to another digit, then that's another configuration or combination of a four which makes this digit. But if you go to this one, you can use one of these things here, one of these things, of this thing here, and you make different combinations. So you have a combinatorial code, which is very efficient because you can use these patches again and again, all over the space. Okay, so if some property, if this, Color corresponds to some property. Maybe this property is used here, it's used here, it's not used there, so you can combine all these properties together to create also new things. Is it more or less clear? I just wanted to give you intuition about that. So what I'm saying is that the RBM is actually working, can work in this regime, which is an interesting way of representing the data. Okay, so I, I think I will stop here for what I wanted to, to show. And maybe I have half an hour or and I wanted to show you some applications to real data. I don't know, we want to do a pause or I, you should tell me. Maybe it was hard, so. Do, do you understand? Yes. yes. So do you understand more or less? I mean, the whole thing is about how to represent data, how to represent distribution of a data in a way which is powerful, and what kind of machine can do that, and try to understand the working of this machine, not just press the button, but try to see what, what it means in terms of phase diagram and so on, in connection with what 
with what is known in spin glass um, in statistical mechanics. You want me to, to be more precise in the definition? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I skip that. So if you want to understand that and to give a precise meaning to that, you can study what is going on in a, in a random RBM. So in principle, if we were serious, what we should do is take the data, learn the data, and then study the machine. And this is what you do in applications. Now, if you want to understand what the machine is doing, this is just too hard. So we, it's something much simpler, which is related to what people have done in the Hoffman model, the Amy Kufom Business Key Calculation 84. So take a machine like that. You have n hidden units, uh, n visible units, sorry. And the number of hidden units I call alpha n, because I know that that should be the number of patterns, so the same notation. OK, so alpha is the aspect ratio of the machine. That's the number of hidden units divided by the number of visible units. Now you're, you can put some fields, G, which is uniform to make life easier, on the visible units. You have some potential acting on the hidden units, which is this potential with a given threshold, a, a given curvature. I assume it's the same for all hidden units, again, to have few parameters. And now I will assume that my weights here are drawn independently from the distribution. So with probability 1 minus p, I will put for each pair I knew, I will put a 0 with probability 1 minus p. I will put a plus 1 with probability p over 2 or minus 1 with probability p over 2. So that models two things. That models the fact that, as we see here, there is a huge sparsity. So p controls the level of sparsity. And the remaining weights are large. OK? In fact, that's a model which was introduced by Barra and collaborators some, some years ago. OK? And now I'm asking, what is going to do this machine? So here, there is no learning. You assume that the, the outcome of learning is something like that, and you, you just do something. And you ask, if I do this, I, I look at this machine, I do Monte Carlo, what are going to be the uh, configuration on the visible layer? And what is going to be the typical representation? Okay. So that you can study with uh, replicas and the uh, spin last stuff or so on. Okay, let's forget about that. And um, let's see what you find in terms of phase diagram. Okay, so what you find is the following thing. So you see there are many parameters. In the Hoffman model, you had a single parameter, which was alpha. <coughs> Here you have many. You have um, the threshold value for the rectified inner units. You have the local field, G, you have the curvature, you have alpha, obviously, and you have P, the sparsity. So, now the point is the following. Um, you can really understand there is a real phase transition when P goes to zero, otherwise it's a crossover between two regimes. So when P goes to zero, you can ask in the representation layer, how many hidden units have a magnetization order one or the order one? means that the, the, the weights are very, very sparse, which is the limit of interest. And you ask, how many hidden units have large magnetization? So large inputs and so large edges that are above threshold. And this number L is going to scale as one of the P. And this is obvious because if you want to make up for a digit, which has, let's say, half of a pixel wide, half black, if you have to compose it from patches which are smaller and smaller, you need a larger and larger number of patches. If there are p pixels which are different from zero in each patch, then you need one of the p patches. So that, that's obvious. It has to scale as one of the p. But so first, of, first of all, we do n going to infinity. 
and then p going to zero. So the machine is enormous, and then you send p to infinity. So this number is still very, very small compared to alpha n. And now you ask, what is going to be the free energy of this model as a function of L, which is this coefficient here? So you see there are three regimes, depending on the other parameters. We have the whole field regime, where the free energy is a monotonous, monotonously increasing with L. That means the higher the number of strongly magnetized hidden units, the higher the energy, the less likely it is. Okay? That's bad. So the best situation minimizing the free energy is here. So you have a very small number, essentially one hidden unit which is activated. Then what happens is that this phase is in competition with the spin glass phase. Because you, there is also a spin glass phase which corresponds to all hidden units having zero magnetization and they are just noisy. And that depends, that defines some ener free energy here, which is obviously independent of L, because it doesn't, L does not exist in a spin glass phase. If you vary the parameters here, depending on theta, g, gamma, alpha, what is going to happen is that the two things will cross at some point. Okay, and this is the usual half field phase transition at alpha equal to 0.14. You go from a ferromagnetic phase to a spin glass phase. So what is new in this model? In this model, you have another phase, where, which is in competition between these two the other phases, which is this one. Now, this curve here is non-monotonous. So that means that the minimal here, the free energy, is here. Okay, and depending on the parameters, you can be here. So that means that the number of hidden units which are strongly activated scale as one over sparsity, and that corresponds to this compositional regime I was mentioning. So here, that's a prototype, and here, that's a compositional. Of, and of course, you can have a spin glass free energy here, or it can be here. If it's here, then you are back to the same situation. This is a spin glass phase. So that corresponds to the three regimes I, I wanted to, I showed intuitively. So it's a real transition only when P goes to zero, otherwise it's a crossover. So that corresponds to the three regimes. Here, that's the whole field ferromagnetic regime, which is the top one, you know, when you have L equal to zero and you have energy like that, that's a mixture model. Here, that's a kind of spin glass, everything is activated. When you go to another configuration, it gets completely reshuffled, you don't understand what is going on. And here, that corresponds to this thing here, where the configuration in the visible layer is built from a large number of hidden units, but small compared to the size of the layer. And which one you choose, which L you choose among the alpha N, gives you a lot of combinations. So you can express a lot of things, a lot of objects. So it has a good generative power. Is it clear? More or less? I think it's important to understand how this machine works. I mean, So in the Hopfield model and, and sort of similar models, there is sort of a role that's played also, important role played by the learning rule that you use. Yes. Right. So what's playing, is, so is the, the U of H uh, sort of playing the role of the learning rule here? Yeah, so depending on the U of H you use, then it will shift a lot all these boundaries of the transition here. Okay. So that, that, that is important, I agree. So for instance, if you choose a bad U of H, then this thing you will not see unless you go to the extremely large, um, extremely large values of the, um, of the hidden layer. But then in practice, that's extremely bad because given the number of data you have, which is always, always finite, then you will do overfitting and you will see nothing. So it's important that you get into this regime with not too large hidden layer. So absolutely, so you need good U of H. And, from empirically, it seems that this, this rectified linear one 
which is something that people knew in computer science. They knew empirically it was a good one. That's much better than the quadratic one, definitely. Patterns of activity you wanted to memorize. It's something uncorrelated. It's a local min there are plenty of local minima. It's just an artifact of uh, all the interferences between all the different patterns. So you always have, as Friton says, you always have a large number, of huge number of local minima compared to the number of patterns you have. But the point is, the question is whether you, the basin of attraction around what you wanted to memorize, is it, is it big or not? Okay? So if alpha is not too large, it's big, and you will converge very easily with zero temperature dynamics. Um, as you increase alpha, it becomes smaller and smaller. At some point, there will be no basin of attraction anymore, and the local minima are not related at all with the patterns you wanted to memorize. So it's just, uh, it's just noise. And I, I'm uh, saying that it corresponds to this regime. Oh, OK. Yes. So, OK, so in the Hoffman model, you have two overlaps. One is the overlap between your configuration and one pattern you would like to memorize. So it's, morally speaking, it's closer to magnetization than an overlap, but that's called also an overlap. So in that case, when you are in the um, memory regime, so below this critical capacity, that means that you, if you start with an overlap which is not too close to zero, then you will converge to an overlap which is very close to one, as the dynamics is, okay? And if you are above this critical capacity, then the overlap becomes zero. There is no way you can do anything. And there is the overlap, which is a spin-spin configuration overlap, which is Edward's understand one, which is tell you something about this this glassy local minima. That's something else. Okay. So there are three regimes: the ferromagnetic phase of the Hoffman model, the spin glass phase, and this other regime here, which is specific to this machine, which is interesting because I I, I want to argue this is the regime where you want to be in order to have a nice representation. So you, you have to tell me what I should do. I mean, whether you want to see some application or, or maybe you are below critical capacity and, and that's it. Yeah, as you want. I mean, it's really up to you. I don't want to uh, overload you. Um. Yes, I uh, wish, yeah. Maybe in half an hour or something like that, I could show you some application. I mean, I, yeah, sure, of course. I mean, you, you, you decide. I mean, all of you.